Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today I want to continue with our discussion or comparison of DC and DCC and see if we can't wrap it up. A lot of what I'm going to be showing as far as the figures go will be out of my book, Wiring Your Model Railroad, uh, published in 2015 by Kalmbach Publications. Uh, it's available from the uh, Kalmbach uh, Hobby website uh, in their book section. You can also find it at uh, Barnes & Noble where they have both the paper and a digital version so that you can download it. Or you can find this also on Amazon.com. So what I want to do first is to go back and take another look at the power cab because you know, I showed you uh, here on the modules how to install the power cab system. And it's a very nice and very powerful uh, command control system for beginners. And as I'll point out later, it's important from the standpoint that it offers an upwardly mobile uh, path for you to go from the power cab to the more uh, expensive and more, much more powerful NCE uh, systems. So, you know, this is one that I like a lot. It's very good for uh, not only for operating your model railroad, but also for programming decoders because it's a very robust uh, decoder programming process is built into the command station, which is right inside of this little uh, handheld throttle. And as you move up to larger and more powerful NCE systems, you can use this handheld throttle with it. Now, one of the important things that I showed you when we were putting together the DCC system for this module that I'm standing in front of, but you probably can't see, um, is that like DC, it only takes two wires uh, to go from the DCC system to your power bus on your model railroad. And after that, you know, it's, it's simply a matter of uh, using the handheld throttles to control trains. And because each uh, DCC decoder address can be up to four digits, you have potentially 9,999 uh, individual addresses to choose from. So you can operate potentially a lot of trains. Now, in a lot of systems, the upper 20, 30, 50 or so of those addresses are reserved for uh, other uh, uh, functions. So you don't have 10,000 addresses in most cases. In reality, it's a f a slightly fewer than that, but it's more than you're ever going to need, I think. The main limitation that you will run into with your uh, a potential number of locomotives you can operate is the amperage available uh, from the command station or booster that you have to go with your DCC system. Because for every locomotive in HO scale, you have to plan for something like half an amp. And so once you start adding that up, um, you've got two locomotives per amp. If you've got a five amp system, then you've got power to operate 10, maybe 15 locomotives, depending on how uh, fast you want them to go. If you're doing a switching layout, you can do quite a few more. But that's more locomotives than you can probably operate physically on a small uh, switching layout. But it just gives you the potential to be able to have a bunch of different locomotives and, operating, uh, and, and operate them. And plus, if your friends come over and bring their throttles, then they can also operate additional trains. And you don't have to have that complicated uh, setup with uh, uh, toggle switches or rotary switches or whatever in order to route power from your various cabs to the various blocks on your layout. So it, to a large degree, it really takes a lot of the headache out of trying to operate a model railroad. Now, a lot of people will tell you that DC is easier. It's easier when you're using just uh, one power pack and a, you know one oval of track or something of that nature. When you start getting out to two trains and more, then the complications really start to build quickly and it's not easier than DCC. The biggest issue that most people run into with DCC is learning the technology and, and, and the terminology because it's all new, but it's no different than if you go out and buy an iPhone or an iPad or some new computer and you have to learn a lot of new technical terms and how to use that. So it's simply a matter of sitting down and working with the devices and learning how they work. Okay, what I want to do now though is move on and we'll take a look at uh, a few diagrams to explore how DCC works. And then I'm going to close with a look 
at the pros and cons, uh, major pros and cons as far as I'm concerned, for selecting DC or DCC. So let's move on. Okay, before we get started, I want to ask you to take a second to subscribe. Click on the subscribe box, and when that comes up, click on the little bell right next to it and click all. Now this is a depiction of the DCC signal that is occurring on your track. And I want to point out the importance of this and the difference between a DCC power and DC because it, it is very, very different. As I showed in the first uh, video on this series with DC, you just have electrons running out to the track and coming back on the other rail after they do their job or do their work turning the motor or running a light bulb or whatever. With DCC, it's a bit different. So basically what you have here is a situation where, let's say this is left rail and this down here is the right rail. And what we will have then is at any given point in time, first one rail will be on and then it will go off. This is a zero point of reference here. And then the right rail, let's say, would have the power on and that will go off, and then the left rail, and right, and so on. And it just keeps alternating back and forth. The other thing here, you'll notice that there are different widths. We have this narrow band here, and that is because it's only on for 58 microseconds. And then it can bounce down here and be on for 58 microseconds, and so forth. And then all of a sudden, we've got this wider one at 100 microseconds. And so that's on, and then this one's on for 100, and then we've got a 58 and a 58, 100, 100, 100, 100, and so on. And the way this uh, is set up is these 58 microsecond width bands are designated as ones, and these wider 100 microsecond are the zeros. So you've got one bits and zero bits. And if you've ever taken a class in computer electronics, uh, you know that a uh, computer code is based on zero and one, off and on, uh, bits, and that makes up the structure of the computer code. Uh, the commands that are sent out to your decoder are encoded in this zero and one bit configuration like this, and then they go out on the rails, so your power is constantly bouncing back and forth, and it can be anywhere from 58 to 100 microseconds uh, in duration. So the important thing then is that DC power is just straight power, whereas DCC contains power since it's alternating between, say, 14 volts on one rail and 14 on the, on the other, and so on. It's always bouncing back and forth roughly between the same voltage. But there's no real polarity to speak of. There is no plus and minus. There is a 14 volts, and then there's zero. 14 and zero, and so on. Um, in effect, though, that does create the same type of issues as you see with polarity, and you'll see it with DCC as well. So you have to be aware of that. The big difference then is that DC is power only, whereas DCC signals are power plus data. So you have a power transmission line and a data transmission line compressed into one. And that has very important implica implications for how we wire our layouts for DCC. Because in the old days, with straight DC, you just strung your wires out and there was no problem. If you do that like that today, then you have problems with the data communications end of things. So you have to be aware of how to properly wire a DCC layout. Now, a lot of people will tell you, oh, I wire it just like I did my old DC layout, or I just converted my DC layout by hooking up the wires to it, and it runs fine. Well, yeah, you can get away with a lot of things because it is a very robust system. Um, there are some things that it's sensitive to, like dirty track and dirty wheels, but otherwise it is very robust and can take a lot of hits with respect to the kind of things that we do when we wire a layout. And on a simple four by eight foot layout or something on that size, you know, it's not a big concern. But when you get to larger layouts, 
Then you have to be concerned with things like twisting your wires or at least using something called zip cord so that you don't have data transmission errors popping up as a result of this. Now another big, uh, big concern too is that with most power packs, um, you're only, you know, you're maxing out at maybe an amp, something on that order, maybe a little over amp, very often a little bit less than an amp on some of your cheaper toy train uh, power packs. And that's a big difference because with DCC, you're up at, you know, three, five, eight amps. So that's a heck of a lot more power going through your wires and through your rails. And that too has impl implications for how you wire because you need to make sure that you have large enough wire and that it's done properly in order to not degrade the power or to affect the data structure built into the DCC power signal. Now, this is a, uh, a small layout. Um, it was the Virginian uh, Model Railroader project layout from, oh, back around 2011, 2012, some, somewhere in that time period. And uh, basically, it, it, employed, it, it had two sections. It originally started out with just the Virginian uh, layout here. It had a small staging yard uh, called the Thin Branch, which eventually was expanded into another small addition. And then it had the original Turtle Creek layout up here with a mine extension. Now, a lot of people seem to feel that DCC is really uh, better for a, a very large layout. I feel the opposite. I think that uh, it gets, gives you much, much greater operating potential on a small layout because even though in this case I've broken these layout, this layout here up into four separate districts, you could operate this entire thing without circuit breakers at all. And in the uh, video series that uh, Model Railroader did uh, for this project railroad, the Virginian Railroad, um, they did not use circuit breakers. This whole thing was operated as one large layout with just one command station right here and individual throttles are connected around the layout. So why have I broken it up into four different blocks? Well, one of the things that, I, that can happen with DCC is if you go through a switch set the wrong way or if you derail on some points or anything like that, um, it can cause a short, and that short uh, can shut down your booster or your command station uh, itself. And that gets annoying because, you know, every time somebody goes through a closed switch, every train on the layout stops. Now, of course, with DC, that never happened because uh, each individual power pack would shut down. So if you had four power packs, four cabs on a DC layout, and somebody ran through a switch in one block, it didn't affect the other three. And that uh, can be a problem with DCC because if you don't have your layout broken up and protected uh, with circuit breakers, then you can have the same thing because one person going into a, 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 a turnout here the wrong way could shut down operations in the yard, in this coal mine here, and up here at this coal mine. And you don't want that to happen. It gets annoying. So what you can do is basically separate the layout into individual blocks uh, and isolate areas like yards and switching areas like this where you might have a lot more potential for short circuits to occur. And then you can install uh, commercially available circuit breakers or even taillight bulbs off of uh, automobiles. Uh, and, and I show in the book how to do that. Um, and that allows you to isolate electrically each one of these colored blocks. Okay, so what I've shown here is very easily you can take and create a block here that encompasses this yard and all of the turnouts here where you're likely to have short circuits. Uh, you can have this blue line here that goes out to the thin branch staging yard with its uh, uh, turnouts where you could get short circuits. And then you could have another one here, this yellow line that's a little indistinct, that goes up to this mine. And uh, that could be a potential area where you would have short circuits. And then also up here. So if somebody creates a short here, it doesn't affect what goes on in the yard, in this mine, or in this staging yard. And 
it's a fairly easy way to go ahead and isolate and protect different areas. Now, like I said, you don't need to do this, particularly on small layouts. Once you get to much larger layouts, it can be very important. So let's look at one of those. Now, this is the Utah Belt uh, Model Railroad. Uh, it appeared in Model Railroader on, on, on many occasions. And um, it's a very large model railroad, as you can see here. Let me see if I can... Uh, I can't quite read the type here, but it, it is fairly large. I've turned it on its side here. It, it's uh, shown in, in my book in a vertical uh, format. But I thought this would give you a little bit better perspective on it. In this one, I show how to use one very large 8-amp uh, booster uh, and break the layout up into one, two, three, four, five blocks of different color uh, to isolate areas, as I said, with greater potential for short circuits. So you've got this very, very large he yard here protected by one circuit breaker. And then you've got this long yellow expanse with a lot of switches in here that could be short circuits. And then the blue section with you know, a few different ones where you could have somebody operating and creating shorts. And then you've got hidden staging yards. This reverse loop here with a hidden staging yard in it. And then there's another one uh, underneath of it uh, shown here in orange. And it's, it's uh, right in this area as well. So I've isolated those because anytime you've got a hidden staging yard, there's a lot of potential that people are not going to throw the switch the right way, and they're going to create a short circuit. And out in the visible area, this yard, large yard, very great potential for it. Uh, in an area like this where somebody's switching cars around, they're on occasion going to forget to throw the switch, and they're going to create a short. And the same thing over here. So there are reasons for doing this, and it's mainly for convenience and preventing those kind of, of annoying circumstances that do pop up. Now, how do you go about wiring a layout like that where you've got these various blocks? Well, here's an example where we've got four different blocks. And all I've done is put in block gaps here uh, between them as you would on a DC layout when you're creating blocks. And that isolates the upper deck, let's say, into two blocks and the lower deck into two blocks. And then you simply run the two wires from your booster or your command station into what's called a power manager or into four separate circuit breakers. And then the wires simply fan out to those tracks through the power buses. So you'll have four separate power buses, one, two, three, and four, that carry the power out to these individual blocks. And then if a short occurs in any one of them, then the circuitry here in the power manager will uh, act as a circuit breaker and prevent that uh, short circuit from shutting down your booster. So it's sitting here in the middle between your layout and your booster, and it's taking care of shorts as they occur. And these things can trip so fast that the booster doesn't even know that anything has happened out there on the layout. And that's very important because um, you don't ever want to allow a short circuit to go on for any sustained amount of time because boosters, they don't like that. And as Jim Scorsi at NCE will tell you, um, these power managers and circuit breakers are there not to protect your trains, not to protect your track, but to protect your boosters and command stations because you don't want to create problems for them and blow out a booster. To wrap this up, I want to take a look at uh, a list, a comparison of the pros and cons of DC and DCC uh, systems. As I showed in the previous video, DC can be fairly easy to set up for one train. I mean, all you do is connect two wires to a piece of track and you're ready to go. Uh, also, it can get more complicated when you want to expand and operate two or more trains because of the more complicated toggle switches required to go from one uh, cab or power pack to the other. And the same thing goes with the wiring. It's easy for one train because it's two wires to attach to the track. But then with, you know, when you get up greater than one train, you have to have those toggle switches and the duplicate wiring for each cab or power pack in order to be able to control the trains 
or really control the track as you move your locomotives. It can be less expensive for one train because you only have to have one power pack. And very often that will be one of these uh, less expensive power packs that comes with train sets. Uh, once you start buying one of the more, exp uh, more powerful MRC type power packs, you're up, uh, some of those uh, upper end ones are about the same cost as a uh, DCC uh, uh, command station and booster combination. Now power packs, like I said, they're getting more and more expensive. So that's a negative side of that. So if you want to have, you know, two to four trains running at the same time, um, that can start running into money. DC, though, is easy for stationary operations because, you know, you've got a power pack that you can just set up and you can, from one position, run everything on your model railroad. Um, that works fine for a small model railroad. It's more difficult when you want a larger railroad with uh, walk-around operation because there are few handheld throttles available anymore. MRC does make one and it is available for use with uh, two of their high-end uh, DC power packs. So you have the cost of the handheld throttles and of the power packs plus all the wiring that you have to install in order to go with all of that. So this really starts to run into money. Now let's take a look at DCC on the other hand. It's easy in to install as I showed with the power cab uh, installation on the modules. Um, you know, they're just two wires to go to the track and you can run as many trains as you uh, have power to operate. Um, however, with large operations, it can get more complicated. Now, many locos now come with decoders. So that's a very good thing, but it does add uh, to the cost of those locomotives. Typically, you're going to pay about $100 extra for those, uh, for those locomotives simply because they have the decoder, uh, particularly a sound decoder, installed in them already. But that's a lot less than if you have to pay somebody to install one because that runs into money. Now, decoders, therefore, can be added to old locomotives. And I've shown how to do that in uh, some of my videos here. Um, but installing decoders can be intimidating. And if you don't uh, feel you know, comfortable doing it yourself, then it's going to get expensive having someone else uh, install the decoder for you. Probably twice the cost of what the decoder and a speaker is going to be. Um, I feel it makes running many locomotives easy because, like I said, you can run as many locomotives on a single small layout as you have power and space uh, for them. But it does require learning a new set of terms and methodologies. And you know, that's true of any new technology that you get into. If you buy an iPad or an iPhone, there's a whole new set of terms and methods that you have to learn in order to uh, function properly. Another uh, pro for, for DCC is that decoders can be customized for specific types of operations. You can change the speed curves, the way that the motor responds uh, to your throttle settings. You can do all kinds of things with the sounds, uh, automatic uh, sounds and, and the like that just add a lot potentially to the enjoyment of your model railroad. Most systems now offer an expansion pathway which is very important when you're thinking about buying a DCC system. It's important that if you're going to be buying an introductory beginner's system that you start out with a system that will allow you to upgrade to uh, more powerful systems as your needs uh, continue to evolve. Otherwise, you're stuck with a system that you're going to have to try to uh, you know, sell on eBay. And, you know, all of the man major manufacturers, Digitrax and uh, NCE in particular, both offer introductory systems with expansion pathways, the throttles, you know, you can use them as you move up through the uh, different uh, expanded systems and more powerful systems. Expansion adds to the cost, but that's true for DC. If you need to add uh, more cabs to your DC system, that's added cost. But the same is true if you're going to be expanding a DC or a DCC system. It, it just adds to the cost as you buy more stuff. Um, there's lots of electronic accessories available 
to expand operations on your model railroad. Um, the circuit breakers I talked about, they're readily available and fairly inexpensive. The electronics of DCC, though, can be intimidating. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that most people have problems with. If they're not technically and electrically inclined, that you can run into some issues. And that's why I say you're much better off if you can find somebody else or a club in your area that has DCC, you know, get involved with them. And they're there. They're already doing it. And they can help ease you into learning both the terminology and being comfortable with the electronics of the systems. And I talked about the problems with short circuits and the fact that circuit breakers can limit the effects of shorts on the layout. And that's, you know, one of the cons with DCC. It is very sensitive to shorts, and it's also very sensitive to dirty track because um, if you're running along and you hit a section of dirty track where you've been ballasting or um, uh, something of that, or painting or whatever, um, the, the, the locomotives are just going to dance all over the layout when they hit that dirty spot because you're interrupting power to a small computer in the locomotive. With DC, you don't see that as much simply because you've got those flywheels in the locomotives that's going to help you coast over the dirty spots. And it, it just doesn't happen that same way to the same degree with DCC. Well, that's about it for, uh, for this video. I hope this has been of some use to those of you who are new to uh, DC and DCC and are considering which way to go. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where you just have to do the research uh, up front and you just have to make a decision as to uh, how involved you want to get in uh, model train operations. Because I think one of the things about DCC is uh, not just the sound, but the ability to control your locomotive increases so much more and adds so much more to the enjoyment of the hobby that it really is a very positive thing once you get into it and learn something about how it works. So I'll be back here on Friday with another video for you from the DCC Guide. Uh, have a good week, and uh, we'll see you then. Bye now.